hasn't arrived yet, uh, but uh, we, all, we always believe uh, in, uh, in serving uh, those who have come on time. So um, good evening and, and welcome. Uh, as most of you know, uh, I'm Craig Snyder, the president of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Of course, if you haven't already done so, please uh, silence uh, your cell phones and other devices. Um, I am uh, really excited uh, this evening for what promises to be uh, a, a thoughtful and lively exchange uh, between two truly uh, excellent and expert guests uh, on one of the most important, but I think for most people, also one of the most confusing issues of our time, or really set of issues, uh, the effects of social media on politics and society, both here uh, and indeed around the world. Uh, Peter Singer is the author uh, of the important and provocative uh, book with the title Like War. Uh, you'll hear more about the book uh, as we uh, go forward this evening. Um, unfortunately, uh, maybe fortunately for, for Peter in terms of the way the book is selling, but Amazon couldn't get us uh, all the books that we ordered uh, for tonight in time for tonight. So we have a few copies available for purchase uh, at the end of the evening. Um, but um, assuming we'll sell out those few copies, if you would like to have a signed copy uh, of the book, please get us your information, your contact information before you leave, and we will mail you a signed book uh, later this week. Uh, Peter is a senior fellow at New America, uh, who the Wall Street Journal described as the premier futurist in the national security environment. That's a heavy, heavy uh, load to carry. Uh, uh, Jim Barnett, our other guest, is partner is a partner at Steptoe and Johnson, um, the uh, very uh, widely uh, respected law firm, uh, and is uh, a registered lobbyist uh, for Facebook. Uh, by way of uh, full disclosure here, Jim and I are old friends uh, and we're lobbying colleagues uh, for a number of years for other clients and, and other issues. Uh, we have asked uh, that uh, Peter and Jim uh, make uh, a few minutes of opening remarks each. Uh, when they're done, uh, I will engage them in some conversation. Uh, and then, of course, we'll turn to you uh, for questions uh, towards uh, the end. Uh, I have to uh, apologize uh, for the heat in this room. Um, this is uh, the second program we've had since uh, the, the season change, and um, apparently our landlord doesn't know the season has changed. Uh, we've been battling about this, uh, and hopefully we'll get some improvement soon. But in any case, if you're wearing a jacket, feel free to take it off, um, and please uh, just sort of bear with us with that. Um, nothing we can do about it, but I apologize. I know it can be uncomfortable. So with that, Peter. Uh, first, let me begin by thanking you for the uh, opportunity to join you all. Uh, it is an incredibly important topic. And uh, the starting point for it, actually, uh, we are essentially on roughly the 50-year anniversary of the creation of what was originally called ARPANET and then evolved into the Internet. And it began as a space for scientists to link together. And then quickly, it became a communication space. It then became a big business, uh, as exemplified uh, by companies like Facebook, uh, but also as it connected with news, politics, crime, conflict, it became something else. It became like a war zone. And that's the first concept of um, the idea of like war. Uh, and many of us kind of feel this anytime there's an event that plays out, uh, whether it is a presidential election uh, to literally just in um, the news uh, yesterday, whether it was uh, the announcement of a bill in um, Alabama to criminalize abortion, the conversation on it online suddenly features a back and forth of sides battling, not just sharing information, but literally battling back and forth using tactics of what we'll talk about later, disinformation, um, trying to drive things viral, false accounts, you name it. Um, but also you kind of feel it in your engagement with your friends, your family, this back and forth. Um, and so that's the first concept of the idea of like war. And what we did about five years ago is that we began to track how groups around the world were using social media and groups that ranged from uh, everything from 
uh, terrorist groups in Iraq, uh, Mexican drug cartels, Chicago gangs, celebrities, uh, politicians, celebrities who are politicians, Russian disinformation warriors, teenagers, you name it. Uh, and that research across these wildly different groups and wildly different locations discovered a second thing. It discovered it doesn't just feel like a war zone, that actually social media has become a new domain of war itself. If you think of cyber war as the hacking of networks, what we're calling like war is the hacking of people on the networks by driving ideas viral through a mix of likes, shares, but also lies. And in many ways, uh, social media is um, the opposite of Vegas. Uh, what happens there doesn't stay there. And so in these battles back and forth, they affect everything from the outcome of elections, uh, whether you show up to a protest or not, whether you go see a movie or not. Uh, they affect the rise and fall of terrorist groups. They affect public health. We think about things like um, anti-vaxxer conspiracy theory. Uh, they affect teenage popularity. They affect global popularity. Essentially, these battles, they're strange. Um, you have a space where, for example, ISIS's top recruiter is copycatting Taylor Swift or Russian military intelligence units are using the very same tactics that Lady Gaga fans are doing. Just in their case, they're trying to sabotage an election. Lady Gaga fans were using these tactics to convince people to go see A Star is Born or more importantly, to not go see rival movies. So it's this very strange space, but again, it has very real outcomes. And real rapidly, um, over the course of this research, we found not only is it like a war zone, but um, and, and following these kind of uh, aspects of warfare, but in fact, there's a new set of rules that shape not only what happens on social media, but how it affects the real world. And basically there's four, real rapidly. The first is, uh, as the X-Files uh, taught us, um, the truth is out there. Or as a CIA officer put it to us, um, all secrets now come with a half-life. You have this mass scale of observation, commentary, and so it's incredibly difficult to keep anything secret today, uh, whether it is the US military operation to seize Osama bin Laden, which was actually live tweeted by a Pakistani cafe owner, to teenage life, uh, but in turn, we've seen kind of a flip of it of people embracing that lack of secrecy, uh, broadcasting themselves. Again, whether you're talking about a teenager, a um, Mexican drug cartel assassin to um, Beto O'Rourke's uh, entire political campaign strategy is this idea that there will be no secrets. He'll be the one to tell his own story. Um, there's a great quote that's been used by three wildly different people, uh, LeBron James, Donald Trump, and an ISIS terrorist. And all of them said the reason why they love social media is, quote, it's like owning your own newspaper. You get to decide what is the news, and then you get to decide how to share it with the world. The second rule, though, is while the truth is out there, it can be buried underneath a sea of lies. And that's the essence of what we've seen in everything from uh, Russian disinformation warfare targeting um, governments in Europe, Brexit to the American election in 2016, 2018, and again, 2020. Uh, but we've also seen that same kind of strategy hit uh, everything again from teenage life to corporate public affairs to American domestic politics. And the scale of it is much greater than I think we are all collectively willing to acknowledge. Uh, so for example, um, uh, Facebook um, has since admitted that uh, over 140 million Americans were unknowingly exposed to Russian propaganda on that platform. But of course, every other platform saw it uh, from Twitter, uh, one of my favorite examples was an account um, that posed as a Tennessee Republican uh, that um, in and of itself garnered 170,000 followers. It was a um, Russian in their mid 20s posing as a Tennessee Republican. 170,000 followers. That's not the number that actually mattered. On Election Day 2016, it was the seventh most 
uh, red account, not the seventh most read of the more than 3,000 documented Russian sock puppet accounts or more than 60,000 uh, Russian bot accounts, seventh most read overall. Um, to, uh, we can kind of go on and on of, of these examples. Okay, so that leads to the third rule. We now are in a world, not just online, but in the real world, and sort of its effect again on news, politics, war, business life, where virality trumps veracity. It is more important that it goes viral than whether it is true or not. And that can shape, again, everything from who people vote for to showing up at protests, uh, what they believe about science to literally uh, our perceptions of the truth itself. I think a great illustration of this would be um, the uh, confrontation that happened a couple months ago between a group of high school kids in Kentucky who came up to Washington, D.C., and they got in an argument with a Native American. Now, rule number one, we have more information about that than ever before. We've got video of what they were doing from an hour beforehand to the argument itself. We have video from three different angles. And yet my guess is if we did a survey of the people in this room, 60% of you would say the truth was one thing. 40% of you would say the truth was something else. And we'd argue back and forth about it. Um, and again, notice I didn't say what it was. It's just sort of shaping by it. And then these rules lead to the final rule, which is the groups, the individuals that understand them are able to shake up the competitions that they're in and it's creating a new set of winners and losers, whether it's a new set of um, politicians who would not have been elected previously but are now uh, to new types of terror and extremist groups. If you think about um, an ISIS, uh, it, you can't tell the story of its rise to its operations, to its impact on the world without weaving in a story of social media, um, new forms of celebrity entertainment uh, to new business strategies. Um, but this new set of winners and losers has created a whole new set that's kind of the power behind the throne. And going back to the story of, um, for example, a young Mark Zuckerberg, roughly about 15 years ago, he was a um, college kid who created really cool software that originally was designed to allow um, his fellow dorm mates to rate who was hot or not. He went on to become one of the um, not just richest people in the world, but he is now one of the most powerful people in all of war and politics because with sort of a change of mind and, and as a result, a change of business policy, the playing field can be tilted one way or another, whether the playing field is the news business the playing field is um, whether Russian disinformation strategy uh, finds um, an easy target or not, uh, anti-vaxxer conspiracy theory, whether it's allowed or not, uh, far-right white nationalist extremism, whether it's banned or not. Essentially, decisions in a corporate environment have a huge impact beyond uh, again, in shaping not just our belief about science or the news, but literally can shape um, whether people live or die. If you think about the example of Myanmar and mass killings there. And so what we're going through, not just um, as a society, as businesses, but the individuals within the company is everybody's kind of wrestling with this newfound power and this um, newfound uh, responsibility. And you're going to see this continue to play out in terms of our politics, uh, where there's uh, policies being discussed uh, that were once unthinkable a couple of years ago that are now, you know, at the core of legislative battles and the like. So that sort of lays out the, the overall argument of the piece. Wow. I may, I may try to lighten things up a little, but that's okay. <laughs> Peter, congratulations on your, on your book. Uh, do keep, and I recommend you all buy it. Do keep in mind, though, that it's only because of the Internet that I was able to get it last week and read it in time for tonight. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, uh, Craig, for inviting me. I was just up the road over the weekend, and there's a little bit of irony in this. I was there to witness. Uh, I'm from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So I was there to witness at 7.03 a.m. yesterday the implosion of Martin Tower, this great icon of 20th century steelmaking. Uh, which at uh, one point in time, Craig were, and I were talking before, uh, 
uh, at one point in time, you know, at Bethlehem Steel, a Dow 30 company, how could they ever go out of business, right? We need steel. Uh, so here we are, um, ironically, I am, uh, you know, 24 hours later talking about uh, threats in the 21st century uh, and, the, and the internet. And let me offer you some Washington observations, I think, on that. Uh, first, I, I am a registered lobbyist for Facebook, but I don't speak for them tonight. I don't speak for other clients of my firm. I'm really just talking on my own uh, behalf. I am a lawyer, so I have to give you that. Um, the, just a brief political history of the, of the Internet here. Uh, the Internet has enjoyed a paradise, at least until the last couple of years. Uh, it came on the scene uh, like lightning, as very well described by Peter uh, and his colleague in their, in their book. And it enjoyed a, a balance uh, and a, a favoritism from both political parties. On the one hand, Republicans, and I'm one of them, enjoyed the, the free market aspect of it. I mean, here's this great new business model that Americans can go out there and, and pursue without threat of government regulation, and we'll, we'll just let it run. On the other hand, the, the Democrat, Democratic Party in general, uh, really liked the left-leaning politics of Silicon Valley. So if you go back to roughly 2009 or so, really since uh, Facebook has been around, uh, it enjoyed, certainly during the Obama administration and with a, a, a House a, a Republican uh, majority, uh, and a majority in the in the Senate for uh, much of that time, an anti-regulatory uh, a pitch, if you will, because neither party really wanted to uh, put tentacles into what the Democrats saw as this great social force moving forward, and what Republicans saw as really great business going forward. You had the Obama administration in 2010, for instance, uh, regulate really extreme protections on and, and regulations on the internet service provider industry, that is the AT&Ts and Comcasts around here, uh, Charter and so forth, who, are, uh, who have run the pipes that the internet goes through to protect the so-called edge providers like Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, and, and so forth. And meanwhile, Republicans were uh, holding hearings on how great the internet was really just just a few years ago there was they had a hearing a series of hearings in the energy and house energy and commerce committee called the disruptor series and they had they literally had a hearing once on how great apps are so picture you know these kind of middle old aged old guys from texas you know sitting around saying what's an app uh and they uh so it was it was a, a golden era in in many many uh, respects. In 2016, that changed. The election happens. Hillary lost, Donald Trump won. And I don't think there's there can be any question in anyone's mind that the internet and social media had a huge role in it. I do think that, that there's an honest debate about foreign interference and the extent to which that played a significant role. And maybe we can get into that some. But there's no question that uh, Donald Trump's campaign uh, led primarily by a guy named Brad Parscale, who's now chairman of his re-election campaign, used social media very, very effectively. The Democrats blamed Facebook and Twitter and Google for losing in 2016, at least on Capitol Hill. And that honeymoon quickly came to a close. And the, at the same time, uh, and the, the, as the, the internet companies began to look at the very serious criticisms and legitimate criticisms about the, the content on their websites, particularly in view of the, the Russian advertising, for instance, and the companies began to moderate well, the content on those sites, they began to moderate conservative voices on the internet. And that royally hacked off the Republicans. And so over the last two to, to three years, We've seen just in the political arena, a real gathering storm for the internet companies. And then lo and behold, about a year ago, Cambridge Analytica occurred and hit the front pages. And Mark Zuckerberg found himself in a little bit of hot water. Uh, it was hauled up to Congress. And I think really for the first time, the, the big tech internet industry titans realized that their time had come in Washington.
And things have changed very significantly since then. Facebook, for instance, has doubled its workforce each of the last two years. Uh, and that's largely due to the hiring of content moderators. Um, Facebook is gonna be testifying on Wednesday. I'm headed back down tomorrow morning to prepare our witness uh, for his testimony for the oversight committee Wednesday afternoon about the effect of social media and elections. And the testimony is rife. I urge you to tune in. Um, is, uh, goes through all the steps that Facebook has taken in, in the recent past internationally. It's not just the United States, of course. Um, my, and the, 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 I can't emphasize enough how much time we spend as working for Facebook with Facebook and the other internet companies. I also do work for the so-called Internet Association, which is the trade association for the companies. How much time we spend in a genuine effort to get things right. I think I'm very, very optimistic. There's a, a great line in Patton, if you all remember that, where George C. Scott is on the battlefield and he has a big tank battle against the Germans. And he puts up his uh, binoculars, surveying the, the scene and puts down his binoculars. And he said, he says, damn you, Rommel, I read your book. <laughs> so, I've read your book. And, and I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think we're gonna be okay. I think we're gonna get this one right in the, in the way that, that we certainly have in the past. Thank, thank you both. Um, um, so I wanna, I wanna start off by trying to sort of um, get a, 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 see if there's possible to get a consensus on how serious these problems are. Right, sort of on a scale of one to ten, one being it really it really is going to be okay. We're in the birth pains of a new set of technologies, learning how to adapt to them, uh, but it's not sort of a fundamental threat uh, to democracy uh, or to uh, or a threat of, of of turning into hot war uh, on the international stage. Uh, up to the other side, uh, you know, uh, ten being the sky is falling, and these. Uh, these new technologies, relatively new, are uh, are, are kind of a, are kind of an existential threat. I, I I think the audience probably sees and hears a lot of what I would call catastrophism, right? A lot of people who are really sounding uh, alarms. Um, just today, there's a there's a piece that appeared uh, uh, in the Atlantic with the title "Social Media Are Running pol Are Ruining Political Discourse." And then uh, there's a little little quote uh, that, 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 that I wanted to read from this piece today. It says, uh, Trump's was not a coherent agenda, but it worked as a tweetable series of promises. It was compelling to much of the American electorate who no longer seemed to care about the coherence of political rhetoric. And the quote goes on. But when I read that, I paused and I said to myself, I'm not trying to be ironic or funny, when exactly in history does this author think that the majority of Americans cared about the coherence of political rhetoric? I mean, in other words, is that a throwaway line or are we actually able to say this is making things worse than they were before? So I open that question up to both of you. This is all stab at it, Peter, and then you can uh, tell me how awful it is. <laughs> Uh, the, you know, going back to the Gutenberg press, right? We've had yellow journalism, I think, and we've had town criers and we've had uh, bombastic uh, tabloids, certainly here in Philadelphia, uh, but in, in New York and, and elsewhere. So I, I think the, the, the notion that, that a few people can control the hearts and minds of people in the, in the media speaking, and the, the internet in the sense is media, um, I think is not as worrisome, I would hope, as some would, would think. So I think, you know, one of the challenges of uh, talking about the, the, the space, and, and it probably hits when you're dealing in Congress with various legislation and concerns, is that we, um, conflate, we connect uh, 
different problems. So even when you were, you know, laying out kind of a, a, a partisan division, even that kind of breaks up into pieces. So, you know, what are we concerned about here? Uh, for some people, there is an issue of privacy. Uh, and again, there's a positive and a negative to that. More information can be collected on you than, than ever before at the most uh, intimate personal level. Uh, and one of the issues with, for example, the Cambridge Analytica, both database, but the study is it's not just your um, overt, you know, actions, things that you say, but it's the ability to figure out your psychological tells, your pressure points to influence you that you don't even know you're being influenced. The flip side is the more information that's collected on you, uh, the more efficient the service is, the, um, you know, so they know that I might want a pizza at this moment and where I am and have it effectively delivered to you. So you kind of have this back and forth of privacy and, you know, we can have wonderful science fiction visions of that. And then we have kind of the darker version that I think we're starting to see in China of an authoritarian state that's using this to control a society in a way that um, even an Orwell never imagined. Okay. So you've got a privacy set of concerns that's related, but different than kind of what you were talking about, which is, um, sort of uh, a more divided, divisive type of politics. Um, where I would slightly differ, there has always been disagreement. What social media is, um, the challenge that it's brought into it is on one hand, it's kind of empowered everyone. But to go back to your notion of the media is that the media, the very meaning of the term is something in the middle. It was the entity in the middle that determined what was news, and then distilled what was important and kind of shaped people's belief on it for better and for worse. As it's been, you know, like everything from the book business um, to friendship uh, disrupted, um, we have all kind of everything in the middle. But with that, the difference in the past is um, we didn't used to battle over the nature of truth itself you couldn't get away with saying phrases like alternative facts. So you, the, what I'm getting at is the arguments aren't about your policy versus my policy. It's that we literally can't agree on a common set of facts. Um, and that's again, true, whether you're talking about uh, foreign government disinformation or uh, va do vaccines work? What should be health care? What should be health policy versus communicable disease? Well, we can even agree, you know, you have a set now that's saying, well, you know, literally the science of vaccines, which again is one of the, the you know, oldest, greatest scientific accomplishments. We've gone back on that, right? We've been thrown back several centuries. Um, okay, so that's different. They're related, but that's different than internet toxicity. And internet toxicity is kind of, you know, you could think of it as everything from um, conspiracy theory uh, Pizzagate and the like that's related, but different from hate and extremism, uh, which again, you could, you know, it cuts across a variety of spectrums, the rise of ISIS, uh, to, um, you know, uh, the neo-Nazis and the, and again, you can't tell the story of those organizations without hitting this, but that's related, but different than another, another form of toxicity, which is not just merely misinformation, false things going about, but disinformation a foreign government deliberately injecting into the system disinformation. And the scale of the impact um, is, you know, pretty significant when we look at, you know, democracies that are already kind of divided, but sort of very close numbers. Um, you know, I mentioned this, the scale, you know, Brexit, uh, about one third of the um, online political conversation surrounding Brexit was pushed by uh, inauthentic accounts. Um, to, you know, we can have back and forth about our election. What I think is really notable is again, don't just think about the impact of this online, but how it hits all sorts of other forms of even traditional media. So 96% um, of journalists, radio talk show hosts, the booker for a cable news show, the editorial writer for a newspaper, 96% of them use what is trending online to decide what news to cover, what angle to take, who to interview for the story, and then based on how it's performing, click rate, whether to revisit it with another story or not. 
So again, kind of the scale of it is, is much bigger because we often kind of just look at the internet numbers, which are already crazy big, but we kind of, it's hard for us to track its impact in, in, into other spaces. So obviously um, it's a lot to unpack and, and more than we'll be able to do in an hour and a half. But um, I, wanna, I wanna stay with the theme, maybe dig a little deeper on, on the question of sort of compared to when, right? So clearly uh, the pace is different in terms of disinformation, misinformation. Um, and yet there are historical analogs uh, to, to all of this, right? So um, uh, more, than 100, more than 100 years ago, uh, the uh, uh, the British, not a, not a hostile foreign power, but the British sought to intervene in American politics to get the United States to enter World War I. Um, and they, and uh, they, uh, they released to our government uh, the text of a cable that they had intercepted, the, the beginning of, 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 of signals intelligence, uh, a cable they had, uh, uh, that they had intercepted uh, from... Uh, the Germans to the Mexicans. Uh, people may know of what's uh, the very famous Zimmerman telegram. So the, the British tell the American government that the Germans are going to get the Mexicans to, in, to invade the United States as a way to help get the United States into the war on the side of Germany. Well, it turns out that they intercepted that from us, not from the Germans, that they were tapping our lines they lied to the American government, the British lied to the American government about where they got it, and they persuaded the American government to lie to the American people about where they got it. The American government told the American people that this was an American intercept and not a British. So just one example of many, many, um, there has always been efforts by foreign governments using whatever was the best available technology of the time to change American policy. Right? And, to, and to get American public opinion to support a particular point of view. So I, I put that out on the sort of on the foreign question. On the domestic political question, um, I think everybody in this room, or almost everybody, we have some students here, almost everybody in this room is old enough to remember the weekly world news tabloid. And you would walk into your supermarket and at the supermarket checkout lane, you would see um, I, I vividly remember uh, first Hillary met aliens and there was a photograph of Hillary, Hillary as first lady meeting aliens. And then a couple of weeks later, there was uh, Hillary is having an affair with an alien. And then if, uh, and then I don't know, nine months later, I don't know what the alien gestation time was. But a little bit later, there was a cover that said, you know, Hillary has alien love child. Right. So. There were millions of people bought the Weekly World News. I don't know how many of them believed it or how many of them just thought it was a joke, but it, but it was there. It was everywhere. Millions of people read it. Um, now you fast forward to Pizzagate. Hillary's running a, a child uh, sex trafficking ring out of a, 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 and, a, and some people believed that to the extent of of taking action. Right. So my question is, again, a, a, how much of these are qualitatively different as opposed to just quantitatively. I want to hit that, that Pizzagate one before I forget it because it's a great illustration of the difference. So the conspiracy theory um, was that uh, yeah, there was uh, underneath, uh, and I'm from Washington, D.C., uh, underneath a um, popular pizza restaurant that was popular among families, that it was actually a secret sex dungeon where um, Democratic Party figures uh, held children hostage. Now, you kind of laughed it off, uh, subsequent polling found that one third of Trump voters believed it. It also impelled action. Uh, it impelled a man from North Carolina where I, I grew up uh, who said what's fascinating, um, almost his, his description was quite similar to the same thing that was said by um, the uh, shooter in Pittsburgh uh, um, of the massacre there to more recently the Christchurch shooter. Uh, there's this horrible thing going on. No one else will do something about it. I will be the one to solve it. Uh, and so in this case, uh, he believing the false news that had gone, not just kind of um, was a, a goofy story, had gone viral. That's the key, had gone viral, shared not merely in the, um, the the aisle of the grocery store, but passed back and forth by friends and family members and key political figures, 
Um, so he took it upon himself to get an AR-15 and drive from North Carolina up to Washington, D.C., where he um, shot up uh, the restaurant. Uh, families run. He um, goes to the door. Where he believes it's going to the secret sex dungeon, shoots that and then opens it. And guess what? It's not just there's no kids there. There's literally no basement. Um, now, he says, uh, as he's led away by police, um, I guess the intelligence on this was wrong. Now, that term is notable because, again, different than in the past, there was what we call a super spreader who was at the crux of spreading this information, who was a Naval Reserve intelligence officer who had been his security clearance had been taken away by the U.S. Navy and he'd been assigned to urinalysis duty. So when I engage with Navy people, they're like, you know, we kind of, we did what we could with the problem. But um, he spread this information. He was a key hub because online he had hundreds of thousands of followers and was essentially sort of the key of it going viral. Now, the difference in the past is that individual who was the core one spreading it unlike what have happened with um, alien meetings, has subsequently been retweeted by the president of the United States, who is also one of the most powerful figures on social media multiple different times. And he's been invited to the White House itself, where he posed behind a podium using the um, white power hand gesture. So we got a very different challenge than weekly world news because of the virality, because of the changes in the politics, because of um, you can't laugh it off as being in the extremes anymore. Um, and I, kind of a different way of putting it is the incentives, whether it's the online incentives of celebrity to the political incentives to the corporate incentives have warped it in a way that wasn't previously there. Um, and a good kind of circle back to connect it to your point in foreign government disinformation campaigns. The activity that the Russians did, um, you know, they've been doing this since the 1920s. They, they had exactly, you know, what you're saying, there's a long history. They m modeled their operation in 2016 after something called Project Infection, which um, was a 1980s KGB effort to spread the false story that the American military was behind um, AIDS. Now, they planted that story in those kind of uh, magazines or um, Lyndon LaRouche was a key one pushing it back in the day. If people remember him, he was a guy who believed that um, uh, Queen Elizabeth was a drug dealer, all this kind of stuff. But so it was the extremes. Now, back then, the Russians could only reach into the extremes and that operation took them four years to pull off. And they only connected to a couple of hundred thousand people versus today. You know, these points of information, they're able to hit millions within a couple of hours. But circle back to the conspiracy theory issue. That same individual behind Pizzagate, not only has he been retweeted multiple times by the president of the United States, he was also, when we looked at the Russian um, bot accounts, the third most retweeted figure of all by the Russian bot accounts. So when the Russians were going, how do we harm American democracy? They didn't go into the, you know, they didn't have kind of uh, figures that weren't known. They were hitting figures that were going viral on their own, elevating them, but also being elevated by other uh, aspects in our own populace. Not necessarily diagnosing the mental health of all Trump voters, but uh, the, I, I mean, I, I think there are a number on Pizzagate, for instance, I mean, I think there are a number of elements at play there, right? It's not all just social media. Uh, I, I don't, and I, I don't, I, I didn't follow the aftermath of that, so forgive my ignorance. My strong suspicion is that a person of right mind doesn't generally jump in a car with his AR-15 to head to a pizza restaurant in Washington without maybe there being an, an issue or two. But that's, but that's, you know, the same that describes a person. If we're going to focus just on the individual shooter, mm -hmm. then um, by that measure, we, we absolve uh, every shooter, whether it's uh, shooting up a mosque, shooting up a church. Um, yeah, you know, of course, no one, you know, we would if our definition is if you commit an act of violence, you're not of right mind, then we've kind of screened out everything and, and not looked at the underlying causes and the underlying connection points. Right. 
Well, I mean, fair enough, but um, I don't. I also don't think it's fair to to take an entire industry or, or to to lay fault on an entire industry because of some really really egregious examples. And you you chronicle a lot of them in your book and do do so very well. I mean, I you know the oldies but goodies, the Macaca moment with uh, with Senator Allen, for instance. Um, the the you know those things do stick in our minds and everything the, but I, I don't think that that you can uh just lambaste the the entire industry or lay fault entirely at the at the industry for those for those specific things the internet industry social media in particular so let's let's go to the um how do we how do we improve this this situation? How do we, how do we try to make it better? Uh, clearly, you've identified a, no, a number of very very worrisome things that can result from from uh, from the uh, the prevalence of social media, the primacy of social media in our in our society today. So, I'm going to ask each of you top three things, whether it's internal reform uh, by the companies or it's regulatory, uh, or perhaps it's uh, consumer driven. Um, top three things that you think would address uh, some of the uh, challenges that you see being created. Take that. I uh, put out for everybody sort of a, a briefing on sec so-called Section 230 uh, of the Communications Act. That's really the, uh, the, the basis of this whole debate, wouldn't you agree, in, in many respects. That provides immunity to the social media companies, for instance. So did the where did the Pizzagate guy was that Facebook or Twitter or where was he getting his multiple but okay mostly Twitter but he was okay. on Reddit too and yeah so the the in the Pizzagate instance um, the what Section two thirty does is immunize the social media companies from any liability associated with that person's actions in other words if if he had been incited by Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or any of the, the social media companies, Section 230 uh, uh, immunizes them from liability. And that's true. Section 230 extends to all of the comment uh, boards on Amazon. So Amazon is not really, if you go and uh, ridicule a hotel chain because of a, a bad stay there, uh, Amazon is not uh, responsible for that or, or Facebook or Twitter or anything else. So Section 30 is sort of the, the foundation of certainly social media on the the internet over the years congress has looked at section 230 a number of different times the last significant amendment was just last year when congress was particularly concerned about the so-called back page episode uh, which dealt with uh, child prostitution issues and immunizing uh, the social media companies for advertisements that this uh, a company outfitted to to conduct their their illicit behavior um, so Congress is going to continue to look at 230 uh, I think very very seriously going forward but I think more importantly the companies themselves really really get this stuff and again on the the testimony that that will be delivering Facebook will be delivering on Wednesday the the efforts that they have at, at combating what they call coordinated inauthentic behavior uh, across the world in elections and, and other, otherwise. Uh, the efforts they've made at sort of honest ads. Right now, if there's a political advertisement on Facebook, you have the ability to find out where that ad uh, comes from. You have the ability to find out how much has been spent on that ad, where it's being delivered, and, and so forth. So there's been uh, an enormous effort the, I would urge everyone at some point to go to internetlivestats.com. Uh, it's one of the best sites on the internet. It's just a single page. And what it does is give you a real-time sense of exactly what's going on on the internet at any given time. So it'll show you, for instance, how many Google searches have been conducted that day. It'll show you how many people are actually on Facebook at that specific moment in time. How many tweets there have been that day. And the, the notion, it's, it's awe-inspiring, uh, the notion that we're ever going to be able, governmentally or otherwise, to police that outpouring of social interaction around the globe is it, it, I, laughable, 
but it's, it's not going to be possible. Uh, so the companies themselves, I think that's where it starts and it certainly has started. They get it. Um, the companies themselves, and we'll see whether or not Congress down the road steps in so far, consumers haven't marched away from these companies with their, their thumbs on their mobile phones or with their mouse pads, right? Or their mouses, um, consumers continue to go to Facebook. They go to Twitter. Those numbers continue to go up. So there has not been any kind of commercial impact on these companies at all after the 2016 election, after Cambridge Analytica, after uh, data breaches and so forth. So it, it will, it will take uh, something very significant that hasn't <laughs> a lot significant has happened already uh, for there to be a change among uh, people and, and therefore Congress. I like the way the, the term that you used, um, immunize. You used it in a, in a legal term, but I think it uh, applies more broadly. Uh, there's a lot of parallels with public health. And in public health, uh, we, in, there's a role for everyone. Uh, we, you know, there's a role for government, whether it's sponsoring research to building hospitals to there's a role for private uh, business and drug companies, hospitals too. to no one says, wow, well, the government's doing something on public health. Uh, I don't need to cover my mouth when I cough. And it's the same phenomenon when we talk about this space that essentially I break it down and there's a role for government uh, in particular um, at, the, at the federal level. Uh, we don't have a strategy. And by that, I mean the Trump administration did something that neither the Bush administration or the Obama administration did over roughly the last 15 years, which was um, issued a, a United States government strategy for cybersecurity. That was a great advancement. It came out a couple months ago, except it has literally zero words, let alone sentences on this entire side of the problem. It was all focused on kind of hacking of um, infrastructure, not a hacking of democracy. That's the same thing that's happened around discussions on election security. We've had um, you know everything, uh, lots of congressional hearings to um, a White House cabinet meeting uh, where it's on voting machine security, not on how targeting kind of the overall ecosystem. And let me be clear, it doesn't just merely play out at national levels, foreign governments. Um, we see it happening in you know everything from state and local politics, people figuring out again, how to kind of uh, affect the ecosystem around the voter. So what can the one thing the government can do? It needs a strategy. And then from a strategy, you get um, action by all sorts of different parts of government, whether it's um, the State Department um, bringing together all the different democracies that have been targeted by this kind of activity. So we're more cohesive in our response and we're aiding each other to um, creating with DOJ and FBI a, a more effective means for the social media companies to share threat information in a non-liability framework. They can do that with cyber threats in terms of um, who's hacking whom and what is this tool. It's harder for them to share that kind of information on the like war side uh, to the role of digital literacy campaigns. Um, Estonia is considered one of the best in the world at protecting their populace from this because they teach it in their schools. Where's our Department of Education in this discussion? So then you get to the role of the companies themselves. And again, I want to be clear, I'm not beating up on them. They are, um, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a customer of them. I, I, I use it. Now, the challenge is that I like them to, them to parents that are going through the stages of grief. There was originally kind of, of a period of denial. Now there's kind of a period of bargaining. And they've done a lot of things that they weren't willing to do a couple of years ago and to be applauded for that. And there's still other areas they have to go. I think the biggest issue, um, going back to kind of the idea of denial, is um, really about who they are. Uh, they, they see themselves as technology companies, and they are, uh, but they are also now media companies. They are also now equivalent to public utilities. And that's a really hard, different way to kind of frame yourself and who you are in the world. Um, and uh, you know, to use that example of Amazon, Amazon um, doesn't, I mean, actually does police a little bit of the comments. One thing Amazon does really effectively is police which entities are allowed to target their customers or not. And if they're found to be toxic, if they're found to be taking advantage of their customers, Amazon will boot that seller off the network. 
And we have kind of a similar debate going on of these other equivalent companies in the social media space. But I would just kind of, there's, there's a um, more responsibility uh, in, in kind of visualizing who they are, as, as who they've become as they've evolved in, in their power in this space. And in particular, I think, one of the biggest things that companies can do is stop being so reactive to people misusing their network, but rather being proactive in trying to identify when it's happening. So almost every one of these um, ills that have played out on their network, which again, they didn't create, they didn't create the, they didn't, they didn't create teenagers live broadcasting suicide, but they should not have been surprised by that, which they were, or they didn't create terrorists live broadcasting uh, their attacks, but they were surprised by it. And they should not, anyone who, who knew something about teenagers and terrorists could have predicted this. Um, and then we finally get to us as individuals. Um, we have a responsibility. The most important thing to the, the spread of um, a conspiracy theory, foreign government disinformation is not, it's what topic is it, how long it is, it's whether a friend or family member shared it. And to circle back to that idea of um, public health, I teach my kids, cover your mouth when you cough. In no way, shape or form does that protect them, right? It's about them having an ethic of protecting everyone else around them. Now think about the difference between if a friend or family member shared Pizzagate conspiracy theory or some kind of false news story. We just kind of laugh and shrug it off versus if they came up to you and coughed in your face. We wouldn't accept that, but we do accept that kind of toxic behavior online, which is maybe worse for society. I want to talk about that. The, uh, the, we've talked mostly about the U.S. context for this. I want to talk a little bit more about the, the international context. In the, in the early years of social media, there was tremendous optimism. This was going to be a force of liberation. Uh, people talked about the Arab Spring, the color revolutions in the former Soviet Union as being it, it, propelled and, and, and really helped along by social media. You jump ahead again, you get incidents like uh, uh, the persecution uh, of the Rohingya in, in Myanmar that you mentioned and other examples. Um, again, I'm trying to get a sense of balance here. Uh, overall, do you think uh, that uh, the existence of social media as a form of communication in much of the developing world, in much of the non-democratic world, has been um, a, a good thing for human rights or a bad thing? So, I, the, you know, to me, we're talking about, you know, a world history level changing communication technology. So it's, it's kind of like asking, was the printing press good or bad? The printing press, you know, created uh, the possibilities for modern forms of democracy. Uh, you know, you don't get the American Revolution without the printing press. Um, you don't get uh, mass literacy. Uh, if you're a Protestant, you go, you don't get the Protestant Reformation. If you're a Catholic, not so psyched about that. You also don't get the 30 years war without it. You don't get a wave of um, uh, war surrounding it that kill a third of Europe. I mean, so again, you know, you get you get the good and the bad. And this is the same phenomena playing out with social media. I think um, there was we, we make a mistake. And again, this is not limited to social media. This is with a lot of other technologies of having kind of this initial wave of techno optimism that, of course, it's only for the good. Um, and that, you know, that's everything from kind of how we tend to think about technology to how it crosses with, um, uh, you know, uh, self-interest, marketing strategies, you name it. So, yeah, you get that high point in the Arab Spring um, where, you know, the New York Times is talking about the liberating power of democracy. That's why it feels a little bit kind of overwhelmingly negative right now, because we were on this kind of high of assuming it would only be for the best. What you've seen is in turn um, authoritarian regimes, you know, they they've wised up. They've wised up that they can use it to monitor their population. Um, so uh, Syria the Syrian regime looks at the Arab Spring in Egypt and says, well, that's not going to happen here to they figured out it's a way of manipulating their own population, a Chinese social credit system to something that wasn't really possible in the past. It allows you to inject censorship into other nations' populations, which is really what kind of Russia has done is almost a form of censorship 
in terms of changing uh, the discourse in other nations. So again, you know, I can give for, and we try to do this in the book, every impact of it, we gave a good example and a bad example. So there's a good example of uh, Pennsylvania story, a little girl who um, used social media to uh, become a journalist and um, uncover corruption in the city fire department. The city government actually started meeting, sorry, they, they started holding some of their meetings in a bar so that this little girl, when she was at the age of 12 then, couldn't come and monitor what was being talked about, right? This is an awesome story. Flip side, you can you know come up with some activist who was tracked down because of something that they said on social media. So uh, we had a, a, a journalist who posted something on Twitter for nine minutes, then took it down and they landed in a, in a Turkish prison. So, you know, it's a back and forth. I think kind of the, the summary to it is really about the actors learning the rules of the game and not assuming that it's somehow going to work out for the best just because they're online. Um, it's instead kind of understanding how you can um, own this space, how you can shape it. And then, you know, when I said virality trumps veracity, it doesn't mean that the truth can't win. It just means the truth has to be wrapping itself in what goes viral or not. I would just say that, you know, the art of history tends toward justice. I think it gets there through transparency. And the, you know, 230, 240 years ago, there was something called the Federalist Papers being published anonymously. You know, scandalous. I don't. I think King George would have viewed that as disruptive and not, not maybe not something that uh, should should be out there. And so today, social media serves that very disruptive as a that very disruptive force. I mean, I, I think ultimately it's a very good thing, and there there are shining moments like the the Arab Spring, but I, I don't think that there has ever been an authoritarian uh, anti. Uh, humanitarian regime in existence that when uh, thrust into the full light of transparency, transparency that social media can certainly provide, uh, has survived uh, for very long. So ultimately, a force for great good. Okay, we're going to open it up for uh, your questions. Who'd like to go first? Sir. I have a question about uh, one specific individual. The impact of President Trump's tweets in terms of initiating um, not necessarily not only policy, but you know, some kind of statements that have an impact across the world and which he may later on retreat. But yet, you know, this is something that I, I don't think in any previous administration had the speed of that kind of impact. What do we do about that? Well, there's an election coming up next year. <laughs> I don't know. And I think it, it I, we, we don't have any choice but to have this debate. And it's an important debate in the, the middle of the Trump era. Right. Um, and the it's, it's almost unfair. I'd like to have it removed from the Trump era because you're right. The, the president's activities on Twitter have been a game changer as as someone who's had clients who've endured tweet storms day after day. Um, it's not easy. It's unlike anything we've we've ever seen. I remember the, the the I think they even held a press conference when Barack Obama sent his first tweet. <laughs> what, a, what a golden age that was. <laughs> and, and he didn't have another one for six months or something. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Um, the, so I, I would love to have it removed from the, the Trump, the debate removed from the Trump era. I don't think we can do that. And it's it almost sort of, I don't know how to put it. I mean, it, it just it propels it into it magnifies the, the effect of, of social media, certainly. Um, and I don't I don't know. Ultimately, history will judge, of course. Um, but they, they certainly have a day to day effect. Um, I can tell you that in my conversations with very senior White House people, when I called a complaint about 
tweets that are directed at people that I know and love and pay me a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> they say, Jim, you know what? We're in for the ride too. We, we don't know what's coming next. So there's not very often not a grand plan on these things. They are spontaneous, uh, the, the storms in, in particular. Um, I would hate for us to, to judge an industry. Um, I don't think we have any choice, but to, to analyze these kinds of issues uh, with, with that at, at the forefront of our minds. Though. I think it's interesting, you know, you could set aside the, the election aspects of um, Trump and social media. And, and importantly on that, you know, Twitter is where he uh, shaped the news cycle and, and what was the story of the day. As you reference, Facebook is where his campaign won the election. Um, the, the operation was very sophisticated and um, in, they're, they're two very different uh, things going on there. But if you look at what you're asking about sort of um, Trump as a, as a leader and the effect on the international stage, you can sort of think about it in um, a couple of ways. The first is, you know, he, he is the first American uh, commander in chief to have used social media before he became commander in chief and then to constantly use it while he is in office. Not even Barack Obama did so. Um, that meant even though he joined social media at the age of 61, he still brought into office over 40,000 kind of bits of information about what he was doing, what he was thinking to now he has sort of a, a constant stream of thought around that. That is if you're um, putting your kind of intelligence hat on, um, that is a wealth of information that you try and kind of mind to figure out not just what is he saying, but how does he tick? And this, when we think about foreign policy, this is something that nations have, have always done. It's just been really difficult in the past. I mean, you had CIA psychologists that would get like one sentence about what a Russian was saying or doing versus, you know, all of this. So you've got that sort of the intelligence aspect of it, the revealing of yourself um, as a leader. And again, that won't stop. Every single leader moving forward will have that. You have the second issue, which is do the statements have policy weight or not? It goes back to the election. You know, do you take them literally or seriously? And everyone's trying to figure that out when he says something. Is that actually U.S. policy or not? And you kind of have a back and forth on it. You know, my favorite example of it is um, the secretary of state of the United States or our top diplomat was fired via tweet. And when we say, oh, that's just Trump being Trump, the secretary of state is within the um, the succession. So essentially, uh, someone in the U.S. military said the president just tweeted. Therefore, this individual is not in the succession to have access to, for example, nuclear command and control. So if you if, if our system is reacting that way, how does a insert country name here, friend or ally? So you have kind of the policy. When is it policy? When is it not? You have the third, which is it is clear that Trump takes feedback from what is happening online and how he evaluates whether a policy is working or not. The most recent example of this would be um, Republican senators went to him and said uh, this was after the, the change in Syria policy and said, you know, it's we, we disagree with you. We don't like it. And he then called into the room uh, the person that, that essentially monitors social media feed for him and he often puts his own messages and said, tell him how popular it is online. So the president is using that kind of feedback to shape it. And then we have sort of a broader issue that, that I I. It hits the president, but it hits all of us individually is um, it's a phenomenon of presentism. It's the idea that it just sort of feels like there's no yesterday and there's no tomorrow. There's just today. There's just this churn of crisis of the day, news of the day. I mean, you know, it it was border crisis. Then it was Venezuela. Now, today, is it is it Iran? Is it something else? It just sort of feels like a churn. And it feels like the same thing in your own Facebook feed. There's only the now. And so um, and that's something the president individually is very skillful at. But I also kind of go back to um, how do you have national strategy when there's only a now? 
Well, <laughs> everybody woke up. A lot of people would um, agree that the net effect of these technologies uh, on political discourse and maybe just public discourse has been negative at this point. What do you think about the future? Is it going to get worse or better? Are we going to learn our lessons and, and deal with it, or is it just going to get worse with like things like deep fakes and so on? So he asked me to repeat the question. That, uh, so the question was, um, uh, he said, I, I believe the effect of this on political discourse has been negative. Um, what do we see moving forward? What will be the effect of that? Um, uh, do you want to swing first or do you want? Uh, sure. I, I, would, I think it probably gets worse where it gets better. I would hope that there's an evening out over time that as people adapt to the technologies, that the the uh, you know the the crazy uncle that I have that keeps retweeting things and sending me Facebook posts about aliens and Hillary and so forth that 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 goes away that the novelty uh, goes away over time and that, that we just don't see as much activity and that everybody just kind of quiets down a little bit. But look, I mean, it's it's politics is politics and people feel very very strongly about it as they should. I mean, it, and it, I think that's a great sign. Part, part of the, what's missing here, maybe, is that this is a sign that people are engaged. We would hope that they'd be engaged in truth-telling and debating policy issues back and forth. But the, the political engagement, the civic engagement, is something that we all ought to be really, really happy about. I mean, not everyone is sitting at home watching cat videos, right? They're, they're engaged in political discourse with their neighbors and their friends and their, their college roommates from way back. And that's, I think that's a good thing. Um, we just hope that, that over the course of time that we can level that out and stick to the, to the issues. We need leadership to do that. I think the companies are willing to provide leadership as much as they can on that. And they, they certainly, in Facebook's case, they certainly have in terms of voter engagement, voter registration, things like that. Uh, but a lot of this starts at the top. It's interesting because the um, I'm optimistic in some ways because we are we're getting we're seeing action that was once um, viewed and described as impossible implemented. Um, so what and again, whether it was, well, there's nothing that we can do about anti-vaxxer conspiracy theory to actually, you know what, remember when we said there was nothing that we could do just a couple of weeks ago. Now we can do something about it and we're going to derank it or we're going to ban it. Or a different example was, you know, if, if we had been meeting here in um, February, uh, there would have been a very different um, space for uh, whether um, neo-Nazi, white nationalists, uh, extremist information is allowed on a variety of networks. There was a change of mind. And so there's been things, and again, um, there's also our own awareness, whether it's journalists not being taken in by some of these, um, again, operational strategies to corporations um, are learning. Uh, Disney was the target of one of these, uh, basically some of the key people involved in Pizzagate kind of went after Disney and originally Disney uh, kind of, you know, buckled under and then it realized, hold it, this is what's targeting us is the equivalent of what we call a, um, an AstroTurf movement. A grassroots movement is people that are genuinely um, engaged and, and upset and motivated. AstroTurf is when you've created the kind of online simulation of it. And Disney wised up. So we see that kind of learning. And so an interesting question is going to be, can we institutionalize that? Uh, when we're, if we gather here five years from now, will we reference digital literacy classes in our schools? Um, will we reference, uh, to give an example, being proactive, um, uh, Facebook, I, I, I work on traditional cybersecurity. Several years back, Facebook um, did not have tutorials and pop-ups for things like, hey, you ought to have two-factor security on protecting your account. Now they proactively tell their customers, here's a better way to protect yourself. Will they do a similar kind of tutorial on, here's how to keep your crazy uncle from sending things on? Will they, will they provide those kind of tutorials? We'll see. Um, so I think we could, you know, we might get ahead of it. The same thing you referenced though, um, points to the legislative space, deep fakes, 
that can send us down a really dark direction or we get a hold of it. For those that aren't familiar with it, deep fakes is um, using AI to create hyper-realistic imagery. So a video of um, someone doing or saying something that didn't happen. Um, good and bad versions of it. Uh, so the good version of this, um, did anyone uh, see the movie um, Solo? It was the young Han Solo movie. Not a great movie. Um, someone took that and, and part of why it was bad is the actor in it was really not good. Someone took that video and manipulated it to insert and what looked like young Harrison Ford. And it's way better. This is a great example of a positive use of deep fakes. In turn, someone has taken video, for example, of Barack Obama and had a speech that he never gave or kind of a, a little pro, it's not a full deep fake, but a weaponization of this is someone manipulated video of um, the kids who became gun control activists after Parkland to make it look like they were tearing up the US Constitution when they didn't do it. So deep fakes, good version, bad version, what do we do about it? Um, I'm of a believer that legislation shouldn't ban it for free speech issues, but that we as individuals have the right to know when we're interacting with something that's false or not, so that it would be labeled in the same way that um, if you're on Twitter, there's a blue check that labels if it's authentic or not. So will we have that kind of legislation or not? And then finally, on the political impact of it, everyone's going to be using social media. Will politicians who use it to engage um, their constituency in a positive way thrive? Or will people who use it to kind of push fear and anger thrive? We'll see. Please. I may be oversimplifying uh, what I'm going to say and my thinking about this. Um, but I'm wondering whether uh, the whole strategy of using the social media is, um, especially in, in, in um, Washington, and I use Washington as um, I use Washington as a whole, you know, all the people who represent uh, uh, the country. Um, it, whether, whether this is a, just a, I mean, not an ingenious, I better not use that word, but very clever, cunning strategy to have, uh, to throw red meat or a red herring, is that the, is that the um, metaphor? Um, so that uh, different groups of people can uh, go running after uh, this red meat and that red meat. Red, what red meat? Guns, Bible, education, um, everything, uh, 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 all the things you were saying, everything except who, what the real enemy is or what we should be really focused on. Um, and, and social media is being used to have people engaged, like Peter says. They're all engaged in guns and all these other topics. Um, Donald Trump, whether we should impeach him, he really isn't the problem. He's just using. He's a, a terrific, a cunning, clever actor. He, you know. I'm going to stop you. So let uh, you, you put a well, lot on the table. Let, uh, let well, our guests respond. Thank well, you. I just like to put a period on it. Quickly, good. Thank um, you. Well, I thought it was coherent enough that I'm going to. I think so. I'll, I'll build on that. So essentially, you know, that idea of engage, you can use this space to engage people for good or for bad. Um, you know, I, I <laughs> because what the real problem that we all have to worry about is what, where, who are the people who are deciding how much we have to pay just to own our own property? I mean, what, who? Who does this calculus so that we have mortgages for our 
wife, which is what mortgage, the root word of mortgage is mort, which in French or Spanish or the Romance language, mort means to die. They in intend for us to keep paying until, you know, for our life. Yeah, this is Sorry. what we should be Sorry, we, got, we have a lot so, of people so want to ask questions. So let me just hit that real quickly. So the idea of engagement, you know, it can be for good or bad. It can mobilize people for things that we judge to be good or bad. Ice bucket challenge. Social media by kind of tapping into our own psychology, but also what's more likely to go viral, a tailored campaign for the good, to get people to care about um, activity against a certain uh, disease. But that's those very same things can be tailored to manipulate people, can, as you reference, can be used to divide people, to, to drive them towards different topics. And I think one of the, the challenges of um, when we looked at the, the, the Russian government disinformation strategy is that for the most part, um, we think of propaganda as make you like us, you know, blue jeans, rock and roll, whatever. Russian government, going back to the Soviet era, has been about make you distrust everything and also find points of division in society and drive a wedge at them. So, and the challenge is that it often layers over things that are already there. So my favorite example of this is um, the uh, protest against Nike. Uh, there was, you know, it may have been one of your clients or not. There was an online boycott against Nike after they had an advertisement with Colin Kaepernick in it. So, of that, that online protest, it was made up of three groups, people that were genuinely upset with Nike, that genuinely cared about it, a second group of what we would call as kind of inauthentic alt-right trolls posing as people and the like, but Americans, and then the third set, Russian bots kind of seeing kind of a fire and going, can I toss a little bit of kerosene on top of it? And that's really, we go back to the challenge that um, the companies are facing and kind of their, their um, efforts moving forward. When we looked at elections more recently in Europe or the like is what do you do about these? You know, there's sort of three different groups, people who genuinely believe, um, people who are, you know, kind of inauthentically, you know, basically engaging, um, manipulating the rules, and then a government that's going after this politically. How do you tease each of these out? And then what throws our, ch what makes it even more challenging is, do we agree that all three actors are legitimate or not? If we're okay with all three actors, then we're going to be stuck in this. And I personally don't think I'm fine with category number one. It's, you know, the second two categories is what we got to figure out how to handle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Please, please. I'm sorry, we have to let this well, go. Well, President, did you understand my question? Yes. The yes. point of Yes, please. We have to move on. I'm sorry. One of our students, please. Okay. Yeah, so how do you feel that the government's like really leading for the social media system? So for like, how like, in other countries, such as China, they only allow one social media, while others are like banned. You they like using more social media, like Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, is making like people more diversified to different parties. If you could repeat again. Yeah, I, I think the question is also around government control over social media and the contrast currently between certainly the United States, Western countries, and China, for instance, which has Tencent, right? And that's about it. <laughs> they have Tencent for everything. Um, you know, there has been, thanks to uh, 230 and, and other laws, there hasn't been a huge governmental effort to control social media. Um, and that's in part, the, Peter used a word, utility, before that I would take issue with because the internet, in my view, and social media companies are, are an example, are purely choice. No one has a gun to anybody's head to go to Facebook tonight when you go home or Twitter uh, or uh, Google or any other company. You don't have to buy goods from Amazon. You have a choice. Now, you don't have a choice more than likely, 70% of us don't, and they're internet service providers, right? Um, 
in, I live in Alexandria, Virginia. I have one choice. There's one wire that comes into my home and that's from Comcast. So I don't have any choice. Comcast has far more control over my life than Facebook ever will. Right. Uh, so the, and that's a, a, a basically a government sponsored monopoly for Comcast in, in my area and in many, many other areas around the country, particularly hard hit or, or rural areas. Uh, so the, the government, I don't think has any role in controlling social media, uh, in terms of content and so forth. 230 provides the, again, the foundation for much of the internet and social media and any changes to 230, we have to be very, very careful about. I think it's, what's interesting about your question is it links back to what, what you asked related to human rights um, and kind of the the notion, you know, originally we had the internet um, would bring us all together, um, and, you know, literally network us, but also shared ideas, shared news, shared information. But what's happened is um, more what they call kind of the balkanization of it, where where you are physically located in the world and what government you're under really does shape your internet experience and in turn its impact on your life your politics your beliefs itself so you know you even among democracies there is a very different internet experience in the united states than um uh, france germany there's there's certain things that are not allowed you move over to um in some authoritarian states there are the same platforms that we use, a Facebook, a Twitter, whatnot, but the government is using it to monitor on scale. So, you know, I referenced that, you know, you post this person retweeted something for nine minutes, government sees it, says, okay, I'm arresting you for that. Then you have other um, nations where uh, the government is able to um, not just uh, monitor on scale, but control what is allowed or not online. So the issue with the China is to me, not just Tencent, it's um, the great firewall. It's the, you know, if you uh, if you search for uh, ten, the events of Tiananmen Square, it did not happen. Right. Or a different example would be when the Panama Papers uh, went out, literally a delete order went out. And for a period of time, you couldn't even find mention of the entire country of Panama on, in, on the entire Internet for anyone in China to then you move towards something which is not kind of um, negative censorship, but it's a social credit system where you're giving people rewards for certain behavior online. So you're kind of shaping them, not by threatening them with jail, but you're you're um, incentivizing them to certain kind of behavior. And so that's, you know, it's just a very different outcome than what we anticipated. And one of the issues for the United States is to figure out is um, the models, each one of them is, uh, you know, the, the China model, for example, is being, um, we tracked over 30 different nations have been uh, in kind of communication, negotiation, talks with China on potentially bringing that model into their nation. And that ranges from the, the Vietnams to the Cubas of hold it, the regime saying, I'd like that model of the Internet because it will allow me to control my populace in a very different way. I think we have time for two more. Sorry, obviously we could go on all night, but we can't. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so Mark Zuckerberg has talked a lot, but I guess recently about evolving the platform from a virtual town hall to a virtual living room. How do you feel about that and what implications could this have on, I guess, broader privacy politics and protests? Well, I think it's just the greatest statement ever. <laughs> I think, you know, Mark's thinking on that really has evolved over time. And it certainly results the the latest thinking. It was a March 6th uh, Washington Post op-ed, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, has evolved from the out of the Cambridge Analytica uh, experience. I mean, I think he gets it on privacy in particular. Um, I, I would say, too, just beyond the 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 Zuckerberg phenomenon and how he feels and it's it's genuine uh, social media companies like Facebook and like Twitter Jack Dorsey 
uh, like Google are, uh, they're for-profit enterprises, right? Uh, they have, perhaps with the exception of Facebook, uh, they, they have a board of directors that they have to respond to. They have stockholders that they have to be responsive to. They're in the business of making money. And if the companies, if, if the customers of those businesses, in this case, in Facebook's case, it's uh, just people on the, uh, on the platform, are not happy, they're not going to devote their eyeballs to it. Advertisers are going to know that. And Facebook isn't going to make as much money. So the, the, the privacy thing in particular has become a commercial issue for Facebook and the, and the other platforms. And they are likely to take far greater steps on internet privacy issues than the Congress will ever get around to doing. It goes back to the discussion of, um, you know, what are our concerns uh, and how it, there's issues of privacy, there's issues of toxicity, there's issues of division. And I think, you know, this, this question of um, what does Facebook uh, which, you know, it's important you know, when I engage, um, you know, I was like a, at, a, at a high school and, you know, all of them like Facebook, you know, that's what my grandparents are on. And you're like, oh, you know, are you on Instagram? Like, oh, yeah. And you're, you're on Facebook. Right. I mean, you, you kind of you have an empire. You have an overall business that has a, a, a variety of different subsets. And so um, this you have a, a, a it's uncertain what the future of kind of Facebook overall, what will it look like, say, two years from now? will this vision play out or not? Um, and there've been, you know, sometimes there's been uh, uh, ideas of what Facebook would look like that, that, you know, has been announced and then two years later it doesn't achieve and other ones where they've turned on a dime. You know, we don't know. Another aspect of it though, is that it's wrapped up within a discussion of a debate around monopolies that, you know, three years ago would have been an incredibly extreme part of um, American political discourse. It's now something that you hear raised by um, presidential candidates and including it's been mentioned by on both the right and the left. So I don't think it's going away. And so some of the things that Facebook is doing, it's very conscious of that potential threat of breakup. And so it's taking actions because um, it obviously doesn't agree with that threat of breakup. So you have, you know, part of it's a privacy discussion. Part of it's about the future of the company itself. Um, but to go back to that, what can companies do? One of the questions about this idea of moving to what they call kind of the more the groups model is what will be its effect on the pathways of hate, extremism, conspiracy theory, disinformation. Um, and we really don't know. There's indicators from what played out in the Brazilian election is that it actually may make it harder to track these kind of toxic behaviors. So I think what people are asking for is, hey, Facebook, as you're starting to propose this kind of you know, vision, how are you gonna build in the fire breaks to sort of the bad things that we saw play out in other spaces. Can you do this here? What, what's going on? Let's have that kind of conversation because it's not just an issue of privacy. Okay, time for the last one. Yes, Ken. Uh, Craig. Um, Peter, if I can ask you, um, you mentioned privacy early on. I'm just curious if there's any evidence that you're seeing that because of misinformation, disinformation, lack of privacy that people are starting to retreat from the process of being engaged in social media and maybe, uh, you know, throttling back their use of technology because of this. They're basically tired. It's a great question. It's actually been pushed by um, some people of, of saying, you know, that's the answer. It's, 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 it's the, it's the just say no. And, and, and again, when I say some people, you know, literally, I, uh, you, you Silicon Valley folks saying, well, I don't let my kids on it. And you get that kind of irony to, um, was it, it was the, the first chairman of the board of, the, of, of Facebook has, has said that the reality though, and it kind of goes back to your discussion about utilities is a couple of things. The first is, um, most people don't have that choice. They need to be on social media, whether it is in 
certain parts of the world where, you know, literally if Myanmar, um, the Facebook was the internet for the vast majority of the population. You know, uh, there are vast parts of the world that don't have that kind of choice to people in certain professions don't have that kind of choice. You know, good luck being a insert everything from real estate agent to um, a four star general and not being on social media to being a politician today to whatever, to being a teenager today. Most people don't have that kind of choice either kind of, you know, where they are physically located or to who they are. And then finally, like they are for-profit companies and it's, um, they are designed around engagement that you like the just say no idea. There's a problem. They're addictive. They're literally psychologically and physically addictive. The, and I'm not beating up on them for that. I do the same thing too. in the same way that coffee is addict. I drink my coffee in the morning. I check my Twitter in the morning. So most people don't kind of have that choice. So while you are seeing kind of micro versions of pullback, it's not on mass scale. Um, and I, and, and, and to go back to the notion of just say no, I think any kind of campaign that pushes that will be as successful as the just say no campaign. <laughs> okay. I want to thank uh, Peter and Jim. Thank you all for being here.